This is Hacker Public Radio episode 3459 for Thursday, the 4th of November 2021. Today's show is entitled Linux in Laws S01E42, the open source initiative, and is part of the series Linux in Laws. It is hosted by Monochromic and is about 73 minutes long and carries an explicit flag. The summary is the open source initiative. This episode of HBR is brought to you by anhonesthost.com. Get 15% discount on all shared hosting with the offer code HPR15. That's HPR15. Better web hosting that's honest and fair at anhonesthost.com. This is Linux in Laws, a podcast on topics around free and open source software, any associated contraband, communism, the revolution in general, and whatever fancies you tickle. Please note that this and other episodes may contain strong language, offensive humor, and other certainly not politically correct language. You have been warned. Our parents insisted on this disclaimer. Happy mom! Thus, the content is not suitable for consumption in the workplace, especially when played back in an open plan office or similar environments. Any minors under the age of 35 or any pets including fluffy little killer bunnies, your trusty guide dog, unless on speed, and QT Rexes or other associated dinosaurs. Welcome to Linux in Laws, Season 1, Episode 42. The episode with the Open Source Initiative. Martin, how are things? Yeah, things are great, uh, Chris. Um, <clears throat> how's, how's the English summer treating you? The one that, that will arrive on August 12th, 1 p.m.? No, 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 no. You, we had it already. It's, it's July. Now. <laughs> oh, sorry, did I miss that? Okay. Yeah, you missed it. You missed it. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't come over now. It's, uh, nothing. Um, I, however, over... on, on, the, on the plus side, um, the, the, the football team is still in, so... If you're interested uh, in such a thing, another 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 mistake made by UEFA. If I'm completely <laughs> missing, sorry, sorry, I, I correct myself, Sicily. If you're mis- if you're listening, not a smart move because the the money was actually on Germany. <laughs> but anyway, not to worry it, about it, this. It, it, this no. is not a show about football, but rather on uh, about all topics open source. And tonight we have a very special guest, Martin. Why introduce? Why don't you introduce our special guest? Yeah, so tonight's guest is a very fine lady called Deb Nicholson, who is part of the Open Source Initiative and has done a lot of great work. And hopefully we'll find out a bit more about that tonight. Welcome to the show, Deb. How are things? Great. Uh, Thanks for having me. Um, I think we got your extra English summer here in the U.S. And if we could (laughs) give it back, we would. Um, We don't keep it. That's okay. (laughs) Are you sure? I know international shipping is kind of a, yeah, but uh, we would send it back if we could. Oh, that's very kind. Hey, Martin, hang on. I thought the hosts were in charge of the jokes. <laughs> no, Maybe no, I'm no. wrong. No, no. Do you want me to take those any, back any, as well? Anything goes. Anything goes yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, very, very good to have you, Deb. Thanks. Maybe for the two listeners in the audience who do not know what the OSI, the Open Source Initi- Initiative, stands for and where it comes from, maybe you can shed some light on the acronym itself and the history of this important initiative. Sure, yeah. Uh, so the Open Source Initiative has been around for, I think we're now at about 24 years, and um we started as like what's like how how do we position like what is going on in the developer world uh that's been called free software for like a business community and 
uh, so that folks can kind of get a grip on that. And also to add like maybe a little bit of a layer of, uh, well, professionalism, but professionalism for tech, like you still don't have to wear shoes or whatever, but, uh, but we have to agree on what is open source and we have to agree on what makes a license usable. And so the open source initiative has been occupying that space. We do get new licenses all the time. Uh, some are, some we accept, some, uh, we don't, uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, and we try to provide a lot of guidance on, uh, like what our best practice is in addition to choosing like a real license that other people recognize as open source. Before That's we go. Short. Yes, before, thank you. But before we touch on that very important subject of licenses, mm -hmm. what else does the open source initiative do for the community and beyond? Yeah, so we also, we have a lot of different um, resources and stories. We keep track of different things that are going on in open source standards. If you, uh, you know, Simon Phibbs, he's uh, kind of our man in Europe for a lot of those conversations. Um, Although it seems like the U.S. might be finally ready to have some conversations about open source in an official way, which is very exciting. Uh, so we keep track of a lot of those conversations. Sometimes that means that we'll submit testimony. Uh, sometimes that means that we'll uh, become part of a lawsuit as a like with by submitting an amicus brief, uh, something like that. So we keep track of a lot of that stuff, and then. Um, we do in other years, though, where there's not a pandemic going on, we attend a lot of events and give a lot of uh, talks or uh, host workshops on how to get involved in open source and how to become part of it. And we also ask, act as a fiscal sponsor of a couple of uh, open source projects as well. You just spoke about events. I think it was at a FOSTEM, as in the Free and Open Source Developers European meeting, where mm -hmm. I ran into the OSI actually at a booth called Manned by Simon Phipps. Simon, if you're listening, that was, I think, in 2015, maybe 2014, something oh, like that. Oh, could be. Yeah, so um, pre-pandemic. Yes, indeed, very <laughs> much so. And this is basically, that was my first touch point with the OSI. Oh, um, Yes. It's good to know those booths are worth it then. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so that's great. And I think Simon might have actually been a board member at that time. And uh, one of the things that we do ask our board members to do is to pitch in on the booths, uh, which is it's kind of one of the nicer, you know, we have as a nonprofit, we have a lot of different work that we could do. And probably one of the more fun ones is talking to people that are like, oh, I'm into open source or I'm into like free and open source software at an event. And I took time out on my Saturday to come learn more and we get to talk to those folks. Wow. At events. So that's really fun. Okay. I yeah. mean, when, yeah, when I, when I look at the list of, of past board members, I mean, you have a very impressive legacy, I might add. Names mm. like I like Ian Murdoch and Eric S. Raymond come to mind. Some Ian of the Thomas forefathers, Murphy. exactly. Some of the forefathers of the op of the open source movement. Yeah, it's uh, we've been around for a long time, and uh, what's interesting is that I think like what is you know what the open source community needs has uh, evolved a bit. Like it does still need that core mission that we do, which is you know, making sure that the open source definition is well known by people and looking at new licenses and making sure that people aren't, you know, putting in stuff like the chicken dance license and things like that and trying to uh, say that that's open source. But um, yeah, it's been a long time. Simon's been a board member on and off for a while. Allison Randall. Um, Josh Simmons is our current board president. So uh, you know, we, uh, we keep managing to find folks that want to do a lot of free work to make open source work. I also noticed that actually a guy called Guido von Rossum was on the board of the OSI at some stage. That doesn't necessarily mean that all your software that the OSI uses is, is written in Python, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, actually, that might be a little easier. Um, we've had, we've picked up a lot of different technology over, we, I would say that many of our board members have been pretty passionate about technology. So that means we've tried a lot of technology over the year, not over the years, not just Python. So that's good to know. Yeah. Although, I mean, we recently, I think Guido has joined some, a, a company called Microsoft, if I'm completely mistaken. Uh, I don't know if Guido and I are connected on LinkedIn, so I have no idea, but, uh, he's not on our board now. Um, so yeah. 
it's uh everybody's everyone's always moving i assume we just will always uh there, nobody's ever really gone from open source it's kind of it's like one of those movies about like how the mob comes back and asks you to do one more job mm, okay <laughs> that sounds a bit scary <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, without any guns and probably a lot less money. Sorry, <laughs> no guns involved. Glad to hear. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, the OSI also sponsors a couple of open source projects. Is that right? Yeah, one of the big ones is clearly defined, and so that's why a project that um, uh, is focused on making like some of the labeling and the licensing uh, a little bit clearer and having that kind of be baked in. Um, and we've had a lot of different projects over the years, like uh, another one that people love is Floss Desktops for Kids. And that's, you know, giving uh, free software laptops to kids and teaching them how to use them. Uh, we also are coordinating with Brandeis University and doing like, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a mini courses uh, for intended for professionals that want to learn how to do open source. So we, uh, we work pretty closely with them on the curricula and, uh, and then the, the actual, you know, educational infrastructure. Brandeis has been a university for like a hundred years or something. So wow. uh, they take care of all that part. Mm. That's uh, old in the U.S., just so you know. Yeah. I suppose many people know the OSI from a very important work on open source licenses. Uh, maybe you can explain for the one and a half listeners... <laughs> <laughs> that are not familiar with uh, with open source licenses, the the most important traits, um, and I'm not just talking about GPL type licenses as in copyleft licenses, but rather the open source source initiative definition of an open source license before we kind of enter the discussion. Yeah, so um, so open source licenses, and I and I've worked, I've kind of worked for everyone. Before I worked at the Open Source Initiative, I worked for the Conservancy. And before oh, that, did? I was at OAN. Mm -hmm. Wow, and okay. And before that, I was at the Free Software Foundation. So I've kind of worked for everybody. <laughs> so, oh, you worked for uh, the FSF? Yeah, that was my first job in free and open source software. I'm in the Boston area, so I worked in the office okay. when people did that. But you didn't have to suffer from something called RMS. <laughs> I'm um, joking. <laughs> I, I would say that actually, like when I worked there, RMS was doing a ton of travel. And so I actually was working there for probably like five months before I met him. Hmm. I yeah. see. Yeah. But we're um, going to touch on RMS later on. But sorry, I, I, didn't, ooh. I didn't want to interrupt you. So <laughs> I hope we're not actually going to. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so the open source definition is not so different from the free software definition and encompasses a lot of the same points, but, uh, basically like it's no restrictions on selling or giving away the software. Uh, the program has to include the source code as well as like any source code that you need to put it together. So if it's like a bunch of separate parts and you can't compile them without like another piece, then, um, it is an open source unless you provide that little piece. Um, and then you have, you have to allow for people to, uh, remix the software, like to make modifications or improvements, uh, and then allow them to be, uh, out under the same terms as the original license. So you can't like take that and then take something that somebody's made available open source and then, uh, change the license. Uh, and there's not supposed to be any discrimination against persons or groups or fields of endeavors. That's the one that's gotten a little bit spicier over the last couple years, uh, with the ethical source conversations. And then, um, a lot of the rest of it is, uh, you know, kind of housekeeping. Like if, if you're using a program with a license and you redistribute it, don't strip out the license because, I mean, that's just dishonest and not good, but it also doesn't work with the open source definition. Uh, and then you can't, um, kind of going with the field of endeavor stuff and the, um, people or groups, like it doesn't magically become not open source if you put it in a certain device or use it in a certain setting. Um, maybe you just mentioned the ethical background. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that because I just heard about it, but I'm not familiar with the details. Yeah. So we've been having a, or there's been like kind of in the larger technology sphere conversation about like, could we uh, create an open source license that did not allow people who were, I'm, I'm doing air quotes, you can't tell, but I'm doing air quotes who are evil, um, which, you know, uh, I'm personally what, what, opposed to evil. 
What does evil mean in that context? Right. That's the question. Uh, everyone is generally per like personally opposed to evil, but then no one has the same definition for what that is. Um, we probably agree on some stuff, but a lot of those things are actually already illegal. So like can't, um, you know, you can't kill people uh, legally. And so like, should you be able to kill people with software? Like the answer is still no, but not because of the open source definition. It's illegal to kill people. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, to some extent, yes. I'm, I'm just trying to connect uh, open source and, and killing people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, an example you might consider is military application of yes. uh, software. Right. So, like, you wouldn't actually, like, I don't know, uh, type pew, pew, pew and watch people crumble. But it's but once you decide that uh, the software that you've written, it could end up, maybe it's got, like, a really good... Uh, geographical location thing, and you intended yes. it for cars, but someone applied it to drones that have guns on them. That what this is was what I was just thinking about. Yes, the application of open source, free and open source software, and actually military applications, guidance systems, weapon systems, the, the whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, because yeah. in, in that case you would restrict usage, right? Uh, well, so. So here's the interesting thing. I did earlier say that killing people is illegal, but it's not illegal if you're the government. If you're what? So if you're the government. I don't know. If, I think that's the case for you all as well. But in the U.S., if you're the government <laughs> and, you are, and you're the military and you're taking action that's been voted on by, uh, you know, whatever aspect of the government authorizes military force, then it isn't illegal to kill people. It can still be immoral. That is a different, that's an open question, depending on who's doing the killing, where it is. Uh, but it is an elite. So is that covered by either the law or a software license? Right. No, I think, I reckon that's one of the main differences between Europe and the US. Because in Europe, you would have to have a committee that would do a couple of sessions and then decide on if somebody's going to get killed or not, where in the yeah. U.S. basically you have a lone gunman taking charge of things. I'm exaggerating, but... Uh, yeah, but probably only a little bit when you think about it in broad strokes, which is not something that uh, I would say is a selling point for the U.S. Um, <laughs> it's... Um, I, I don't feel like ridiculously okay. safer than you all do in Europe for us having a ginormous military that can people without doing very much paperwork, um, in case you were wondering. Uh, but I'm also not certain that that belongs in a software license either. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a, I appreciate the idea, but the, the, that, that way of dealing with it is a, is going to be, is going to be a little tricky one to, Apply, I think. I mean, but it's, it's I, not, I a, it's not sorry, a sorry, Martin. Go ahead. Yes, it's, it's not a restriction that you put on it, right? In your in your um, definition, it's right? not in the open source definition. There are people talking about should we make it part of like either a new open source definition or like an expanded open source definition? Like, could we right. say you can't use this software um, version, in a military yeah, application? Version. Okay. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> but then it's a fine line because essentially if you restrict one usage, you might as well go for another one. And who calls right. the shots on this one? And, uh, and, and the military here is, is huge. So like, so we have, um, we have an insurance company that specifically caters to, uh, people who served in the armed services. Like, is that a military application? Can they use open source actuarial tables in their work if we know military usage? Um, what about the cleaner down the street that does like 90% of their business washing military uniforms for dress occasions? Like, are they a military application? Never They're mind. certainly supporting the military. It gets very fuzzy when you, when you yeah. want to say, don't be evil or don't use this for the military. Um, and then of course we have like zillions of other military contractors that have like a mix of clients that are the U.S. military and a mix of clients that are not. So uh, can they use, like, a open source accounting software for their business? I mean, never mind the whole veteran area, right? I mean, if you would basically exclude any software usage for veteran organizations, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, and a lot of that work is, uh, you know, 
unfortunately, because of how the military affects people, a lot of the work serving veterans is helping them uh, find cheap housing or uh, address like PTSD or addiction issues, um, which I think we should do. But that's it's not, you know, is it military? It becomes a really tricky. Um, Indeed. I mean, it's like genetic engineering, right? You can you can use it for different purposes. You can save life with it, but you can also basically engineer the next evil shenanigans. Right. Like we might all want tomatoes that sit on the shelf a little longer, but everyone might not want actually talking sheep. Or some people might want talking sheep. I'm I'm not the boss of you, so. But there's probably more uh, there's probably more disagreement there than shelf stable tomatoes. Yeah. So so we work on um, like so we look at licenses and see if they fit this open source definition. Uh, and the thing that changes is the technology. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the the like, kind of the social landscape, but the technology landscape changes a little bit also. So like. Um, we were recently looking at the cryptographic autonom autonomic license, CAL. We call it CAL for short, which is easier to say. And that was trying to get at, like, could we make it so that the software is, and the source code is audible, but uh, draw a better, brighter line between people's personal information and the software in this particular application where they get mixed in a way that's a little bit new and a little bit different. And we decided, like, yes, that makes a lot of sense. In order for people to use open source software uh, in, like, a cryptographic sense, like having a bright line between the software and people's personal information definitely serves the goals of the open source definition. Okay. There has been a lot of controversy around a certain type of, say, open source but not free and open source licenses in the meaning in, in uh, on the likes of common clause something called redis source available license comes to mind maybe you can shed a some more light on the vetting process that the uh, that the osi does for a new open source license and also maybe if you're so inclined <laughs> i know it's a, it's a minefield <laughs> to to maybe maybe to comment on some of the recent developments and i'm specifically including common clause here um as, as the as the second point yeah so uh so some of the so um so we talked about the ethical source licenses it was sort of an expansion of um like the open source definition and the question you just brought up is like could we retract a couple of pieces of the open source definition it's like could we make it so that you can't uh you can deny this software to certain fields of endeavor, certain companies, certain groups, people with certain motives. And so that would be like a shrinking of the open source definition, which we're also opposed to. Um, so we look at these licenses and we look at them not not just like how they're written, but how they will interact in the field because uh, they don't exist in a vacuum. The way that, um, the way that a license like if a clause doesn't say discrimination against a certain field of endeavor, but uh, but that is the way that it effectively would have to be applied in the real world, then we would turn down that license. And it's a lengthy process, or it can be a lengthy process. If it's a shorter license, it can be a, a shorter process. But um, generally, we have a group of folks that uh, discuss the license with folks. So that's license discuss. And, um, and they try to help people... Uh, kind of get to a place where the license is, is readable. They kick the tires a little bit to make sure that it's, uh, that they're not using words that don't mean what they think they mean in other jurisdictions, like that uh, other English speaking jurisdictions. We, we can't be completist in that way, but, um, and making sure that, uh, those, uh, licenses make sense and people can understand how to apply them. And so we sort of try to help folks, uh, get that license to a place that makes sense, is doing what the license author thinks it's doing, and then it goes to uh, the like the decision-making body. So we take a look at how that license will behave and if it will um, grant all of the privileges that the open source definition grants to users of its software. And if it doesn't, 
then we say no. Sometimes we tell people, you know, if you took this part out, it would be okay. But oftentimes that's the part that they really got and it is exactly why they wrote a new license. And I reckon this has been the conundrum with many of the recent applications like Common Clause and Friends. Yeah, and this, like uh, we did talk about the um, uh, server-side public license uh, probably not so long ago. Uh, and so, and even the, the Commons Clause like would say that they aren't an open source license. It's an alternative to an open source license. Uh, and, and I agree with, uh, the drafters there that it's, it's not like it's, they want to make sure it's like a, that one is most similar for readers who, uh, go read the whole license if that's your jam, but it, it's sort of like a non-commercial clause is on a creative commons type mm -hmm. license. And that would be a restriction of field of endeavor, field of user. So that one's a no for us. Um, that's uh, and and honestly, like we're we're not completely opposed to people using other licenses. Like obviously, we prefer and hope they come over the open source way. Uh, but if they're going to use another license, it's okay. It just it gets confusing for us and for the community and for uh, other software users if they call it open source but it isn't. Mm -hmm. So that's where we get a little like, hey, I think we're going to have to blog about this and say like. You know, XYZ license is saying that they're open source or not, and they should please stop saying that. Mm. Commons class has not did that. So. No, understood. And, and shifting gears a little bit, I mean, some people may find licensing boring, but at the end of the day, we're, mm -hmm. we're talk, we, we're talking about the effects that a certain license has on the general code base and much more importantly of the ultimate usage that mm -hmm. such a license implies. I have come across quite a few interesting developments over the last year, let's put it this way, where actually people said, now look, copyleft licenses, especially GPL and friends, are way too restrictive for us. For example, there is a certain project called Terminus to be that initially licensed its code base under the Afero GPL, but decided to move to a way more liberal license like Apache, I think they're licensed under, mm -hmm. to allow companies actually to include their co open source code base in tech stacks of their choosing without having to publish any derivative work. And I find right. this movement especially interesting because that's exactly that's exactly actually I think the opposite, where you broaden the adoption of a code base by going for a way more liberal license from an adopt from adoption point of view than the GPL and friends would pres prescribe. Any any thoughts on this? Well, of course, I think that depends on what your goal is, and and I have often told people that you should find a license. Like, say you've come over to the open source blade and you've decided you want. To, um, you still need to make sure you find a license that matches what you're trying to do with your project. It, uh, and so uh, for folks that want, like if you want your project to be bought or you want, uh, you want jobs like at a large company that you hope will be excited by your software and that company is using all uh, permissive licensing, um, you're not gonna get to that goal by using CopyLeft. Um, if that's not your goal, like I see the copy, the goal of copyleft licensing to be a little bit more community minded and a little less like, you know, what do I, what, what do I hope my software will be when it, like my part will be when it grows up and what will it get me? Um, and everyone's got to eat. I'm not saying don't, don't make good business decisions because, uh, you know, some lady told you she likes copyleft licensing. But um, it's it depends on what your goal is, and I mean, if you if you want if you're writing a library for a huge permissively licensed platform, then you shouldn't make it copyleft because no one's going to use it um, unless you're trying to do it as like sort of a art project to see if anyone will accidentally use it, which is also weird. But who knows? Um, 
but if you're if you're working on something like if you're building something new and you're hoping to become the platform and you want people who contribute to that platform to have that code be available as a derivative work when they add stuff to it, then you choose the left license. I mean, you see this one, it's uh, like Git is that way. Um, the Linux kernel is that way. It's like they wanted everyone who contributed or wrote stuff or iterated on that platform, like that big main body of code for it to be automatically brought back in. So, you know, I mean, it depends on what your goal is. Yes, that's exactly the 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 issue with, with libraries like libc, like the GNU libc, which essentially mm -hmm. is the runtime for many open source Operating systems. Um, I totally mm -hmm. see the point that if you put a code base under GPL or some derived work, not necessarily less a GPL, but something like, for example, a, a Faro GPL that is a very kind of, what's what I'm looking for, a more stringent version of the GPL. You yeah. actually have the possibility of fostering innovation that way because of the very mm -hmm. trait that each and every de derivative work as a version of whether it touches a GPL component has to be published as well. Because mm -hmm. in that case, you have the obligation to put your source code out there, which, for example, Linux kernel and all the rest of it does make sense. But on the other side, I totally also see the need for companies Especially if you are a startup and do not want to have your code base right in the open from day one, unless, of course, you happen to be a so-called open core company, where mm -hmm. that is the exact business model, the, the initial code base out on GitHub, and then you have an extended or enterprise version of the software, which is not open source. It's closed source, actually, and this is what you sell in addition to additional services like support and so forth. But at the end of the day, maybe you want to keep, maybe you're, you're, maybe your startup basically running in stealth mode and you want to keep your secret source under wraps for the time being, unless you have enough moolah together, um, mm -hmm. to actually open source your core. I mean, you, you keep code secret. Like none of the stuff about derivative works is invoked until you share that software out in the world. Like, so if you're running, like, Maybe you have like a, a device that feeds your cat and you wrote some code there and you sucked in a little bit of GPL code to start. It never leaves your house because your cat's an indoor cat. Like the derivative part, like where you have to share your work back never is invoked because it never leaves your house. So like in that stealth mode uh, example, like you can use GPL code. It's only when you become unstealth, like when you leave your house, that any of the derivative stuff uh, kicks in. Or you decide basically to sell a stack without disclosing the software. Ooh, as in, yeah. As in I licensing, don't recommend that as, either. As, as, as in licensing your stack, like uh, sorry, yes, like an appliance out there, basically a, a piece of hardware oh, that runs yeah. the code, which it's is of course though. a totally different, totally different ball game. But that's exactly the conundrum here, right? So, right. And if you are, I mean, if you do sell a device, like I saw something on on the internet the other day, they were like, "What's open source?" And one of the answers was, "The reason that my refrigerator comes with a copyright notice." Um, <laughs> but it's okay. It is. I think there are there are a handful of people who are like, "What's this GPL?" And it's like because it came with their fridge and their fridge mm. talks to the internet and has like a little bit of Android code in it or whatever. And, uh, and, and for some folks that is, that is as far as they're willing to go with open source. They're look at that notice and they're like, huh. Um, not for the rest of us and probably not for anyone who's listened, uh, halfway into our, uh, our session here. No. Um, and before yeah. we put, the remaining two listeners also to sleep. Martin, why don't you go next, probably with a different question. <laughs> no, I was actually going to tie into that a little bit. Um, Fair enough, go ahead. I mean, if, uh, okay, so, so from your OSI perspective, or from the OSI perspective, the, um, you're doing education, you're explaining to people which licenses do what and which one to choose and, and so on. Um, the, in the scenario where you mentioned, uh, you know, the obligation to contribute back any changes or any derivations um, uh, of, of a code base. Um, do you get involved in the, let's call it, policing of that piece or is that? Uh, the compliance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the OSI has, has typically not been involved in a lot of compliance work. Um, 
I don't think we're not opposed to people doing there are organizations. Like I said, I used to work at Conservancy and that's one of the main organizations that does compliance and the FSFers does some compliance work. Um, and so uh, that's not something the USI does. We're a little bit more um, like focused on like, hey, let, let us show you how to do this the right way and not so much on the policing. Although, um, you know, uh, that's, I, I don't think, I don't think that's something we would jump in on and certainly not uh, both of the organizations that I mentioned that do compliance work are much larger than we are because uh, we're a single staff person. Uh, so I don't see us doing any compliance work anytime soon. I do think if there was something like, you know, somebody came up with a law to make it illegal to do compliance work, I think we would be opposed to that. Um, or we would definitely have concerns. I can't imagine who would write that and how that would be written, but we would have concerns about who was writing that, especially if we didn't know who they were. Um, so, yeah, so like I do think other organizations should be able to do compliance, but it's not something we spend time on. So you don't get to shoot people, don't drag them in front of courts and all the rest of it. So, 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 so no, 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 we talked about this. <laughs> no, so, so you so much less money. So you're missing out on all the fun parts. Oh, <laughs> I, oh my gosh. If you think compliance is a fun part, oh, wow. So when I was at FSF, here's what compliance consisted of mostly. It consisted of uh, reminding myself once a month to send a note to somebody who had a little piece of code that was out of compliance and to I had a series of letters that would escalate. The first one would be like, it seems like you don't really understand how the GPL works. Like, <laughs> let me help you with that. It was kind of like a clippy note, right? Then the second it would be like, hi, you know, like, if you could forward this to your legal department, we'd like to have a conversation. You know, and so we'd use these escalating quotes, right? And, and um, that's what it was. And it would be long and boring. And then, like, after two years, they'd be like, we're not using that code anymore. Please stop writing. <laughs> okay. So hang on. Why well, that works use... anyway, then, didn't it? Why, why did... uh, kind of, right? Oh, occasionally someone would say, oh, okay, what does that mean? And <laughs> they would let us help them. Um <laughs> Why didn't you bring in the C4 earlier than that? <laughs> I'm just um, because I, well, this was, so this is now going back like, uh, like 13 or 14 years ago. Okay. I think most people, when they were out of compliance with the GPL at that time, didn't know. Like they honestly didn't understand. That was the era still when, uh, you would talk to the legal department and they would be like, open source, we're not using any of that. And then you'd go down to the, you know, IT department and they'd be like, <laughs> of course we are. We're like 90% open source here. Never mind um, the first, exactly. <laughs> right. And now those two departments, uh, at least somebody amongst them talks to each other. And so the idea that you might be violating the GPL and have literally no idea what that is or what violating it means uh, that era is largely coming to a close. Okay. Uh, so that's when we started up, nice. We assumed the best, I guess. You you just brought up the FSF, and given the recent, mm -hmm. what's the word I'm looking for, controversy around certain people. May, and, is this a reward for folks that listen to the first half hour? Absolutely. <laughs> absolute, if not more, Deb, if not more. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. okay. No, of course, I'm, I'm referring to a certain Richard M. Storman, and I can recall the statement that the OSI issued, but maybe you care to oh, elaborate yeah. a little bit on the on the notion behind this and how you see this whole recent controversy that that developed in 2021. And maybe you also have a personal opinion that you want to share? I certainly have a personal opinion. I don't know how much of it I'm going to share. I did sign on to the letter, and not as OSI general manager, but as an individual who previously worked in that office. So the thing is, is that like, so I used to go to conferences when I was at the FSF, and then, uh, and I would go to conferences later, and people would be like, oh, like, and I would be standing at a totally different table, and they'd think it was still the FSF, or like, I'd sit next to the EF table, and and they would call us the EFF or they would call them the FSF. So people get all kinds of confused. And because the FSF is the longest standing organization in our space, um, we feel like we, the OSI felt like we needed to differentiate and say like, hey, if you were in 
danger of taking our silence for like, yeah, we stand with the FSF and agree with their decision to bring RMS back. We don't. So, um, it just, it felt like everybody needed to kind of say where they stand. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate because, uh, I think, um, I think it would be better if, uh, if all the organizations could work together and agree that we do want to see a bigger, larger, like, free and open source software community globally. But a lot of the behaviors that happen, uh, within the FSF's, like, kind of realm there are not doing a great job of bringing in new people and are especially not doing a great job of, uh, making uh, women and other historically underrepresented feel welcome. We recently had a member of the Free Software Foundation Europe on the podcast mm -hmm. who hinted at the fact that actually quite a few people joined the FSF after Richard M. Stallman was elected and after the shitstorm hit the fan. So there, there, there are vicious people out there who may consider this to be a marketing stunt on the FSF side. <laughs> That's so funny because the other, the thing that you get when you're like, oh, I really think that we should be good about diversity and that our mess needs to leave the FSF for that to be possible. The thing that I got was that Microsoft must be paying you. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm okay. like, no, no, we're getting this for free if you think it's in their interest. I don't think it is, but like weirdly, like no, no and um I will tell you that Microsoft has never paid me to say uh that I think that we should increase diversity and reduce harm in the the FSF and that hang on, hang on is Deb. not the best person. Hang on Deb, mm. are you implying that um um so that, that Mr. Nadella is just a puppet and that actually Barma is still running the show? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. It's it's amazing. Like, um there are folks out there on the internet that will you know, they'll look and they'll be like, Oh, I see that you um that you both are on like some Twitter list, so obviously there's collusion there or like you know, you like two people spoke at the same event, so obviously there's collusion there. And it's like, you know, I wonder if uh, if they understand how either Twitter or like open source events work because it's it's like a whole mishmash of people and they definitely don't agree with each other. So, um, yeah. So th that's been like uh, it was even a joke, and I'm like, you know, where's our where's our big tech like shut up check or whatever? We didn't get it, but yeah. Anyway, so that was, I don't know if that was all the, that you were hoping we were going to get no, from that. Okay, no, don't worry. I mean, needless to say, um, we are explicit, but maybe we're not that explicit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and yeah, I'm going to, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, and there's other things that, like, it, it's like, oh, you know, uh, getting down to, like, relationships between individuals it's like well that's not appropriate for a public audience but we can see the pattern of uh like the way that people get treated when they interact with the parts of the fsf that rms is in charge of and, um it does it's it's not growth it's not like welcoming uh and i think the organization could do better but as they uh, uh have apparently decided that my opinion is not good, so. No, it's interesting because I really, I'm really keen on seeing where this is going because there has, as I said, there has been a lot of controversy. People kind of implied that the, that the pro list on GitHub was mostly done by, let's put it this way, pieces of software, not exactly real people. Um, yeah. This is a little bit of a, of a controversy, all right, so let's see where this is going, but clearly... Uh, it's interesting to see who's with who, for example, who's withdrawing funding. I mean, Red Hat made it quite clear that this is not on and simply said, no, look, we're, gonna, we're not going to fund the FSF anymore. And quite a few mm -hmm. other people, uh, sorry, companies rather followed suit. But if it's, if it's true, maybe the personal membership gains from the individuals joining after this make up for this. This is, this is of course pure speculation on my part. 
There's probably a couple, and I'll tell you, I've worked at nonprofits before I got in open source software, and uh, people love to run their mouth in public saying, like, I'm totally going to give money now because of this thing. Or they also like to say the opposite, like, I'm never giving you money again. And if you work at that nonprofit and you look up the person who just made this bold statement that sounds like they've been this $1,000 annual contributor, uh, you can't even find their name in the database. Uh, it's like they, the people like to say that. I'm not saying that the FSF didn't get any members. I don't actually know that because I don't work there anymore. I suspect they probably got a couple. Is it going to make up for uh, tens of thousands of corporate donations? I would be surprised. Okay, okay. Talk, talking about funding, how, how about how are you funded at the OSI? We do a lot of corporate donations because, um, okay. and we do have a individual membership program. Um, if, if you want to, if you want to find a topic that's more arcane even than free software licensing, you can look up <laughs> our 990, which is our IRS filing that we do every year, uh, oh, wow. which we make publicly available. Um, but it's just like kind of the mix of funding from the public and from uh, corporations. But we are trying to make open source um, easier for like companies of all sizes to use and adopt, and that is something that companies find valuable. Uh, we also do want to make sure that our membership of individuals, um, we set that level intentionally low so that uh, people could participate not just in uh, not just in countries where 100 bucks is an easy gift, but in countries where that's not an easy gift. And we do also um, offer membership to students so uh, okay. at, at no cost. So we, we're trying to, like, get – like input from our individual members and funding from our corporate staff. Mm -hmm. It's uh, interesting you mentioned about the different countries and, and um, uh, clearly not not being uh, a membership being accessible to all those countries. How do you see the uh, the split between uh, in terms of membership? Or do you have a, a view of that in terms of how? Um, uh, I don't have anything comprehensive to point like to, that. but yeah. it's uh, but I do like when I went. Um, I went to Brazil on behalf of the FSF, and our, at that time, the FSF's annual membership was $120. I think it's still the same. And almost nobody in Brazil was prepared to uh, write a check for that amount. Uh, I suspect that's – and I don't think that's only Brazil. I think that is a lot of South America um, and a lot of the global South more generally, uh, not including Australia, who somehow – doesn't get included when we say the global south um <laughs> but uh yeah it's um there's a lot of different uh inequities between different countries and what they can of uh, what is a reasonable amount for like a uh like an optional cost like a membership uh, with an organization that you want to support like those numbers are real different all over the place i mean we see the same like um you know with uh, standards essential patents like the amount that uh, seems reasonable for uh, a Scandinavian country to ask for a fee for being a standard essential patent is really different than uh, what might seem reasonable to, say, India or China for using that uh, standard essential patent in, say, a mobile phone. Yeah, I understand. And, and I mean, can you give a bit of insight into um, the, the different countries in, t in terms of what kind of licenses they come to you for? Uh, or is, is that a, oh, like you know well, what I mean? It's, it's, is there a, is there uh, is there a global difference, or is it people are individually deciding what they um, think is best for their project? Um, yeah, so that's. That's, uh, that I could go a couple different directions with that. What I would say yeah. is that um, each each country uh, has its own idea about uh, how intellectual property and business and uh, community interest, for lack of a more specific term, how to strike that balance. Um, uh, the U.S. has like is pretty much an IP maximalist along with a couple of uh, fairly wealthy other countries like uh, Japan and Korea uh, and most of the EU. Um, when you look at the rest, uh, their approach to IP tends to uh, follow along like a cultural or what's often a colonial uh, 
a connection or interest. So like a French speaking country in Africa made a fairly similar approach to IP as a, as France, for instance. Right. The other thing that you see is if there is like a business relationship. So um, if the software is getting written in Europe, but the hardware is being built in Indonesia, then uh, they're going to try to harmonize approach to IP because of the way that the hardware and the software interact. Um, because it's going to be messy if like the hardware side is like, nope, we're giving everything away. And the software side is like, no, wait, that's not, we didn't say you could do, please bring it back. Yeah, that's yeah. not going to work. Uh, so, so you tend to see like harmonization, like, like I said, cultural language or colonial, uh, historical colonial relationship or, um, if they make shared product together. Um, so, uh, so that's like kind of where it starts, but then, um, different places uh, see uh, the impact of maybe like an IP maximalist strategy and how that affects the actual individual people living in their country. And then they may go off script, so to speak, from there and decide to make some carve outs or some exceptions uh, or uh, not participate in certain parts of that otherwise maybe shared IP strategy. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes uh, perfect sense. It uh, sounds like in your work you've come across a lot of those uh, issues already. Or, well, issues. So. Well, because software is global, and yeah. uh, and no, and for and yeah, like we Asking can't just be like <laughs> the OSI <laughs> of the US because like even the software we use here is in here. Like lots of it's made in lots of different places. Most of our, you know, most of the major projects that people depend on are uh, developed in at least like five different countries. So it has to, you can't, you can't like only look at uh, one country's approach on software. And for us, like I said, I'm based in the US um, and we have not had a lot of conversations about open source and standards and uh, and like how or whether to encourage open source usage for uh, public software. But that conversation has already happened in Taiwan, like as far as public use of software and uh, the conversation about like how to set standards and uh, how to like make guidelines for software that include the idea of like a lot of this is gonna be open source. That conversation's already happening. We're gonna, uh, we're coming in a little late we're definitely going to have to have that conversation with the knowledge of how that conversation is going in other places more. Interesting perspective, Deb. Before we wrap this up, a final historical question. Um, okay. Any, any thoughts on Bruce Parents, given the importance of said Bruce for the movement, to use a more rather communist term, <laughs> let's put it this way? Yeah, uh, I, I first I want to say like you know um, everyone loves him over the course of his life, and we appreciate like what he did for the organization. Uh, sorry, Phoenix. maybe maybe for the two people who don't, and uh, sorry, and this is my fault because I should I probably should have introduced him, but maybe you can <laughs> touch some, but but maybe you can shed some light on who Bruce Parents is. Yeah, so he created the open source definition, and he co-founded the OSI with Eric Raymond. Uh, Neither Eric or Bruce are involved with the organization today. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and Bruce has, has a, you know, he has, he always has, maybe you'll have him on one day, he always has some spicy things to say about, like, what we should or shouldn't be doing today. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, he's doing his own thing. I, you know, I, I don't think it's, like, mean-spirited or personal or what have you. Oh, maybe it is. I don't know him very well. Um, but, uh, you know, we uh, – the organizational leadership doesn't – like, obviously, he doesn't agree with us, and so we don't agree with him. I don't know. Were you hoping for something much spicier, like a uh, you know, we killed this dog 10 years ago and he's never forgotten. No, 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 no. I don't no. have that story. That story is not, I don't have that. It's he might not even happen. be a dog dog. Really. Bruce, Bruce, if you're listening, this is purely fictional. Nobody killed your dog 10 years no, ago. No, nobody wants, no, no, I love dogs. I love cats a little more, but I love dogs. But before we wrap this up, 
there's something called the poxes, as in the picks of the week that we normally and that we normally um, subjugate. Is that what I'm looking for? <laughs> Inflect. <laughs> Inflect. Yes. <laughs> Inflect upon our visitors as in our guests. And the idea is basically, if there's anything worth mentioning that has touched you in any way, as in you think that is worth bringing on the show in the last week or two, uh, now this is the time and anything goes. I mean, normally we kind of touch upon movies, books and all the rest of it, but anything really um, is, is is an option. So f- so over to you, Deb. What's your pox? Uh, what's your pox? Pox. Is the word pox is P-O-X? Yes. And so oh, like it's pox- something that irritates pox. me, like a pox on? No, no, sorry. No, no, like a pick of the week. Oh, a pick of the week. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I got it. I got with, with it. I was week. like, I thought we meant like, like a box on your, all your houses. No, no, no. Sorry. I'm misunderstanding. Like, right. My pick of the week. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm enjoying the Loki show, I guess. I'll say that. I appreciate his like kind of fight the power vibe. The Loki show. Okay. Yeah. Maybe okay. you, yeah. Maybe you can explain for our non-American um, listeners um, who don't know the show <laughs> what this is. Uh, it is on. Um, let's see, what's it? It's on. I think it's on Disney, and uh, it's on Marvel. It's like a basically. So I'm a big sci-fi nerd. This is how oh, I ended okay. up like uh-huh. doing software stuff. So this is from the like you know endless Marvel canon. And, uh, and basically, like, so they, like, retconned, which is when you go back and pretend something happened that you didn't have happened originally. Um, they went back and apparently, like, Loki fell in through, like, some time travel hole and ends up discovering this, like, huge 1984-esque time travel sea. And, um... And because the uh, because it's a TV show, instead of squashing him or burying him in history somewhere, they ask him for help that only he can provide, and it's ridiculous ah. fun. And this is uh, and this is available on Disney Plus. I think so. Yeah. Perfect, Disney. If you're listening to us, uh, the uh, email address <laughs> is sponsor at linuxinlaws.eu. <laughs> Donations are accepted, <laughs> and gifts in kinds too. I mean, Martin is always looking out for a Disney Plus subscription. So no, no, just no, no, I, I have touch, one. I'm, I'm a great, a great, great fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Martin, what's your box? Uh, well, funnily enough, it's also a Disney. It's Disney Plus, right? <laughs> but, but in this case, it's. it's hot. Uh, I just sit in your house in the air conditioning and watch TV. Uh, well, not not over here. <laughs> we don't have oh, air. We don't need air conditioning. No, it's too <laughs> hot here. All right, you're right, natural. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's no, I mean, um, UK, yes. I watched uh, I watched the kid uh, fi- film with the kids called Luca, which is really amusing. Um, Luca, um, okay. Mm, it's about a um, uh, an under underwater living um, man like creature, which can also go above ground and turn into a human. So it's it's all into quite quite amusing as a story. So. Obviously, like, it's a kids' film. But they are. Like William B. Gates. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> okay. That's Fine. probably Elon Musk next year. Yeah. When the Mars thing <laughs> doesn't work, he's going to move underwater, and we're going to – it's going to be like Jaws. Like, well, if, yeah. if, 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 he, if he returns from space eventually, yes. <laughs> if he makes if it he back. <laughs> In no one worries. piece, or not a thousand. <laughs> Maybe the, it's like a water landing, and then this what yes, happens now. But Elon, if you're listening, before you go, the email address is sponsor at <laughs> yes, Ideally, before you go. Yes. Okay, my pox of the week is actually a video on YouTube that explains it all. Um, links, of course, as the other poxes will be in the show notes. And this video teaser actually explains what the internet is made of. And funny enough, it's actually made of cats. <laughs> uh, enough, enough, enough teasing. Just check out the the YouTube link. It's very funny. I just came across it the other day, and it's really insightful. Let's put it this way. Martin, we do have some feedback. Claude, you... yes, Claude, you M, favorite listener of the show, um, to the show, whatever. Um, oh, commented sure. on <laughs> yes, commented on forty one. Uh, sorry, commented on the BSD episode. Mm. Best of BSD, great episode. Get gents. That was an awesome interview, and I could and I could have listened for even longer, if you did go if you did go the full three hours, laughing out loud. 
definitely better guests for interview than I'd ever be. No, Claudia, that's not correct. Just reply to that mail that I sent you ages ago mm. and say, now look, here I am. I want to be on the show and we slot you in the wars. Martin, any, any comments on this, on the comment? Yeah, I, I think he clearly um, must have fallen asleep in the middle because it was about four and a half hours, wasn't it? Uh, sorry, yeah, we only posted the editor's version. Actually, it, as a matter of <laughs> fact, it was seven hours long. <laughs> short, short version. <laughs> there may be there may be the B sides coming coming up around Christmas, depending on if we find the time on this. Hmm. But then, Martin, you noticed something odd on HPR, if I'm not completely mistaken, regarding all Claudio. Well, I wouldn't, wouldn't call it odd, but uh, <laughs> full uh, disclosure. <laughs> apparently, a Claudio has been playing around with some hardware and some poetry. Like what? Like haiku or something? Haiku? Hmm. Okay. So, Indeed. Claudio, if you've done episodes already, don't be shy. Just reply Indeed. that mail and you're more than welcome to do a full episode with the Little's In-Laws. It'll boost your ratings. That will, of course, help with your monetization strategy. Big time. <laughs> I'm just saying, and uh, we, we we'd like to know how you put these poems on this uh, on this PC as well. Yeah. Yes, so please come on the show, Claudio. We need people like you to stay insane. I think. Oh, sorry, sane. My mistake. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Martin. Before I forget, we have another one. A comment by yes, a comment by Zenfloater too. This show put me up a tree. There you go. I had to play this show about three times to get all the content out of it. Well done, Zen Floater. Mm. Installing and running GNOME 3 in an OpenBSD is extremely uh, easy as GDM does all the work for you. Interesting, because I thought that System B would play a major role in this, but not to worry about this. Setting up Pulse Audio is probably the hardest part most newbies have difficulty with. Indeed. <laughs> but, but you know, the squirrel is sick and tired of heavy desktops. Well, I got a forklift, right? Um, I'm also getting sick and I'm tired sure of about, Intel. Like, sure, sure Sorry, we're we... busy collecting acorns at the moment. <laughs> of desktop. A acorns, <laughs> of course, <laughs> being home computers back in the 80s, but that's besides the point. Okay. Indeed. I'm Sorry, also kind of... continuing with the comment. Yes, I'm also getting sick and tired of Intel AMD 64 platforms. <laughs> the plastic CPUs from hell. Martin, you okay? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, is the wheelchair uh, <laughs> <up> again? <laughs> I'm, I'm just checking because there's a lot of background noise. On you, right? <laughs> yeah, the dog was eating the headphones. That was why. <laughs> so, it's, so it's not a wheelchair issue, okay? <laughs> For a change. Okay. 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 Um, Sorry. Uh, Carry on. Oh, oh, squirrels. Yes. Yes. Put on some acorns. Um, yeah. I'm, Carry on. I'm also yeah. getting sick of and I'm also getting sick and tired of Intel AMD uh, 64 platforms, the plastic CPUs from hell, and I long for the mainframe days. Here we go, where we just use the dumb terminal. I was happy then. Oh, Zen Floater must be quite old. I have a few hmm. OpenBSD servers to use via SSH, which oh, satisfies it, this urge exactly, but. I need to buy some dumb terminals and put OpenBSD on my Raspberry Pi 400 thingy and take my two Chromebooks and just drown them both in a deep bathtub somewhere. Careful now, this might be, what's it called? Um, mm. In German, it's Sondermüll. It's Explosive. Tox, tox, no, it's toxic garbage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's no such thing as a perfect desktop. I hit them all. Those desktops always have you feeling unsatisfied with life. Oh, there you go. Why do we even put up with desktops? And what drives Fedora to continue on with GNOME? Yes, question. Mm. What are they going to get out of it? What will IBM get out of it? Interesting question indeed. Everyone should run OpenBSD or NotBSD or Fujita, whatever that is. Or how about GUIX with the herd instead of all this Linux stuff? Uh, I'm going to comment on that in a minute. We want something different on the computer table. Really, GNOME and System D is is like a slow creeping cancer. Interesting point. And a boring cancer too, where your limbs fall off one at a time every fourth, every three to four years. Now oh, there you go. Okay, kids. Full disclosure: I heard is not a system I would use for production for for starters. Zenfloat has a couple of interesting points. To be perfectly honest with you, given the fact that 
Gnome 3, especially the level of, of which Gnome 3 is in battle with system D makes entanglement interesting. So maybe there are hacks in Gnome 3 that allows it to run an OpenBSD flawlessly. But to my, but from my understanding, Gnome and system D are getting closer and closer by every release. Um, so that okay. would be interesting to see. At least that's the roadmap um, that I see in the project. Why not do away with um, a desktop altogether? Don't as yes, as as then Floater implied, uh, desktops, as we all know, are of course evil. Goes without saying. Mm. <clears throat> but the trouble is that not everybody has these 1.5 million for a Raptor entry of a class of something called a uh, System Z. Uh, well, you of course, not a mainframe. Just use the terminal. You don't want to use a desktop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you see, funny enough, Martin, this code terminal has to connect to something. Yeah. This of wires course. and R S two three. Exactly. <laughs> of course you can simply buy an R a Raspberry Pi cluster. A couple of hundred machines will do nicely and simply run this <laughs> ZOS or, or, or system Z emulator on top of this. Should give you decent performance, although not quite as fast as this old iron that IBM sells. You're interesting. I mean, the, your comment is pretty interesting about system D and cancer. I would recommend running Dev One if you <laughs> want to take a look at Linux in that regard, <laughs> um, or some other distros who basically or which just have diverted from the path of enlightenment. Is that what you look for? Probably not. <laughs> no, mm-hmm. people. Before you send in nasty comments, I'm pretty neutral on system D. It does have its advantages. Let's put it this way. Standardization, for example, comes to mind. And funny enough, it has been picked up by most distros as the standard in the system and more. Yeah. And before I get further hate mail, no system D is not against Unix philosophy. This is one of the great misunderstandings of, of, of the, of, of the, of the current era, I think. Because if you take a close look at the code base, it's still little tools doing one thing exactly. Pretty much in line with the with the overall Unix original Unix philosophy. It's only the case that these tools form one code base. And I think this is pretty much the misunderstanding that some people still rely on. Let's put it this way. Yeah, stuff for the camp episode on system D coming up. <laughs> Do you know Martin? <laughs> And then, Floater, of course, you're more than welcome to come on an episode and yes. share your insight on this. If you choose to do so, we are more than happy to have you on the show, as usual. And that's all there is to it, right? With regards to feedback. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and before I of course, hiding of course <laughs> Zen Floater has won the award so far for the longest comment ever. Definitely. In loss, yes. yes, yes, yes. A small well, well done, Zen Floater. Uh, yes, and, yeah, a, a small, <laughs> yeah, a small, a small island called um, the UK, located in the in the British uh, in the British Sea, will be on your will be sure on the way the for you. Sea. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean you're looking at face at a face value of about two quid, <laughs> but Great Britain will be yours soon. <laughs> the price has just to come down a bit. I'm sure he will be pleased by that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> anyway. Hey, but Martin, sorry, wait, before we go back to that, there's more feedback. More feedback? Yes, 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 yes. Ah, yes, of course, sorry. Um, yes. Hacker Dufo, uh, Dufo, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, Hacker Defo, or whatever his name is, does he have a name? Uh, I signed it with Biku, so, anyway, so Biku says, a big hello to Dr. Zimmerman and Martin. Full disclosure up front, there is a place called the Linux In-Laws. I first went there for the madness, but I stayed from the knowledge, and now I have become a fan of the Linux In-Laws. Podcast. Yes! We have one! Hooray! <laughs> a real fan. Right, anyway. What sets you... So, he, he continues. What sets you down apart on HBR and even other linux rated podcasts? Question mark. Most of the hosts on HBR and other linux rated podcasts are hackers, users, and enthusiasts. Unlike us, of course, yeah. None of them are do- doctorate holders and scientists. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how, so, how hard anyone can try, pros will be pros and amateurs will be amateurs at the end of the day. Yes. 
That's very that? nice, but do continue, Martin. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So I can't say I've listened to every single episode done by you guys, but I have listened to a great many of them. And for some unknown reasons, episode number 26, a.k.a. Make Your Linux Harder, is my favorite till the date. And this, this, is, is, uh, this is the episode without porn, I might add. But do continue, Martin. Yeah, we don't have that many. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, um, this is not to say that the others weren't good. The way you guys handled and explained the heavyweights called SE Linux and App Armor on that episode was special. I really enjoyed it and also learned a lot from it. I mainly use Debian, so I know that App Armor comes enabled by default on Debian installs since Debian 10 Buster. Debian also makes it a bit easy by giving a couple of packages that provide various App Armor profiles for new uh, for a few applications. These packages are App Armor profiles and App Armor Profiles Extra. Link to these packages in the show notes. Of course, and there's much more in the, in the comment. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, Hacker, therefore, we do not really have the time, but I really liked how you closed up the, the, the comment. And apparently, that fan of the show is Indian. He said that, quote, and I finally end this mail with an old Sanskrit quote. And then he wrote some Sanskrit. And then he says, a rough translation of the above. What is that which cannot be stolen by thieves, nor taken away by kings, nor gets shared among brothers, nor it's a burden on the shoulders to carry. What, if spent well, always keeps growing? What is the most superior wealth? Knowledge. And then he concludes with, keep up the great work and keep spreading the knowledge. Thank you very much, therefore. Martin, mm. is that the, one of the well, marketing... I, I, I think is, he signs, signs it with Biku, right? So. Sorry, Biku, yes. Martin, is that the one, is, is that one of the marketing guys you didn't fire? It's, it's clearly something, someone related to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Martin, I'm just asking because <laughs> if, if, if this is the case, well done, Mr. Visser. <laughs> yeah, for keeping that one right. <laughs> No, jokes aside, be cool. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Given the fact that this is even longer than the previous comments, it's then def- definitely uh, features on the top of the link. Yeah. Uh, and um, also, you made a few suggestions of, of topics, which is also yes, indeed. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate mm. it. So, uh, I think Zen Floater got the British Isles. We gonna donate the whole American North American <laughs> continent to you. So, <laughs> so Biden, if you're listening, please wrap your country. Please gift wrap your country. And send it to Biko. As soon as we get his address, <laughs> <laughs> details will be in a mail sent to the White House, of course. Uh, Biko, just aside, thank you very much for the wonderful mm. feedback. Unfortunately, as I said, we couldn't, we didn't have the time to read it all. But, and here's a special gift. If you're so inclined, we would love to have you on the show. Forget about the North American continent. An appearance on Linux in laws would be much more gratitude i suppose in terms of appreciate it definitely yep yeah. so let, let us know when you're available and yes and just send me just send a um as you did before just send a message to feedback at linux in the you thank you and now back to wrapping up the show with Deb. and Deb, <laughs> thank you very much for being on the show it has been more than a pleasure but and hoping to have you yes, yes. and having uh, and looking forward to having you back soon Fantastic. I'm into it. Thank, Thank you. you and that was all for today's episode. Hope you liked it as much as we did and see you soon. And this is the Linux in-laws. You come for the knowledge. But stay for the madness. Thank, Thank you, you for listening. listening. This podcast is licensed under the latest version of the Creative Commons license. Tap attribution, share alike. Credits for the intro music go to Blue Sea Roosters for the song Salute Margo, to Twin Flames for their piece called The Flow, used for the segment intros, and finally to Celestial Ground for their song Sweet Justice, used by the Dark Side. You find these and other ditties licensed under Creative Commons at Jamando, a website dedicated to liberate the music industry from choking copyright legislation and other crap concepts. <laughs>
uh, recording okay. time is normally between six and seven hours. So we should be finished around 3 a.m. CST <laughs> my time. Uh, and this, is, this is just the edited version. The actual recording is slightly longer. <laughs> Technology can be tricky and BBB is no exception. <laughs> You've been listening to Hacker Public Radio at hackerpublicradio.org. We are a community podcast network that releases shows every weekday, Monday through Friday. Today's show, like all our shows, was contributed by an HBR listener like yourself. If you ever thought of recording a podcast, then click on our contribute link to find out how easy it really is. Hacker Public Radio was founded by the Digital Dog Pound and the Infonomicon Computer Club and is part of the binary revolution at binrev.com. If you have comments on today's show, please email the host directly, leave a comment on the website or record a follow-up episode yourself. Unless otherwise stated, today's show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license.